Hello and welcome to another edition of the Moving Iron Podcast. This podcast is proudly provided by Axon, helping dealers move more iron for almost 100 years. Find out more at axontire.com. Axon was started almost 100 years ago out of a passion for keeping agriculture moving. It's that same passion that drives them today. With a vision for a better experience for both farmer and dealer, they set out to create a better way to move more iron. When you partner with Axon, you get immediate access to a full range of products and solutions designed to meet the complex needs of today's grower. Axon carries all major brands and sizes of tires, wheels, and tracks. From custom colors and sizes to fully customized wheels, you can have the solution for virtually any problem today's farmer is trying to solve. To find more or become an Axon dealer, please visit axontire.com. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Time and time again Through the years you'll find us here Moving Iron Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast. This initial Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by Axon Tire. Helping dealers move more iron for the past 100 years. For more information, go to axontire.com. Once a month, I am honored to have Jesse Peters and someone from his cell staff from Axon Tire to come on and talk about what they see happening out in the marketplace and, and what different tire and wheel com- com- combinations that they see pop up and, and just some, just basically tells from the road here. But this is uh, no different than that. I got Jesse back on here again. Jesse, how you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great. Life is uh, no less crazy than the last time we met, uh, but excited yep. to chat today. Absolutely. I hear you. So Mike Lewis is uh, who Jesse has on here with him and, and, uh, Jesse, why don't you talk a little bit, introduce Mike here a little bit and give the, give the listeners a little background on Mike and what he does for Axon Tire. Awesome. Well, you, you know, I love all of our client advisors, but uh, Mike holds a special place in my heart because I actually just got back from visiting their location, our sister location out in the Bay Area. So Mike and uh, his team out there actually in Hayward, um, I, I got to be honest, I, I didn't fully appreciate the dynamic that agriculture has out there because I'm in the Midwest, we see soybeans and corn (laughs) and, you know, just from spending, uh, you know, four or five days out there with those guys, man, what a, what an interesting dynamic they have. So I'm particularly excited for, for you and Mike to, to chat about, you know, the challenges that part of the country has and um, some of the unique dynamics that, you know, a place as dry and as warm that can farm 365 days a year has when it comes to, um, you know, growing and selling equipment and everything they're in. So yeah, excited to invite Mike Lewis. Mike, how long you been, uh, how long you been doing this? Oh, Jesse. Well, firstly, thank you for, uh, letting me join today and Casey, thank you. Um, Pleasure. no, this is something I've been doing for about 10 years now. Okay. Um, yeah, farming is in my blood. My dad was actually a farmer in England, so there we go. But uh, there you go. So, um, yeah, Jesse, my heart's touched. You know, you, you've really – I've got a place in your heart. I don't know how that got there, but there we go. This is, this is going to be fun today. Looking that forward was, to it. It was awesome. I mean, Casey, as we were driving around, Mike's pointing out, you know, the different parts of – I mean, we spent our time in California, but Mike's territory, Mike, you reach – all the way to the Pacific Northwest, all the way, obviously, down through California and into um, Arizona. So Mike Mike really has a kind of a unique perspective on uh, that part of the country. So um, really interesting. Privileged to have 10 states, actually, Jesse. So mm-hmm. that's seven of them on, oh, sorry, eight of them on the, uh, what, the 48. And then I'm privileged to have Hawaii and Alaska. Having said wow. that, never been to Hawaii <laughs> <laughs> in the 10 years I've been here. Uh, we did do an Alaska trip a little bit back, but having said that, there's not a whole lot up there that is going to pertain to what we're talking about today. So, so if yeah. there are any uh, Hawaii dealers listening to this, please call Mike and then call me next. We'll we'll get a we'll work a trip out there to see you. Absolutely dying to come out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, Mike, hey, it's it's great to have you on the podcast, and I'm I'm looking forward to the conversation and. California, there's there's three states really that I like to really when we talk about 
agriculture and farming and, and the diversity that comes along with that. Three states um, come to mind. One is Michigan, one is Oregon, and the other one's California. And if you take California, there's something like four or 500 unique crops that get grown in California. And there's something like 300 and some that get grown in Oregon. And same with Michigan, there's about 300 or so that get grown up there. And it's not just your traditional, you know, row crop that you would see normally, you know, your corn and soybeans, your wheat, alfalfa, those kind of things. Although all those things are all grown there, there's just a, a absolute vast diversity out there when you're looking at all of the different stuff that's going on. You've got Northern California, which is different than the, the San Joaquin Valley, which is different than the Salinas Valley. I mean, you need all of these different valleys that, and all these different growing areas that grow something different and throw wine country into all that. And that's a whole nother aspect of it. So I guess as a guy that's working with so many different customers that are doing so many different things, how do you, how do you keep everything square and straight from, you know, what one guy needs 10 miles away might be totally, completely different than what the guy just, just down the road might need. So I guess talk about that a little bit and that diversity and how, how you work with those customers to, to meet their needs. You're completely right there, uh, Casey. It's, it's the diversity of the uh, area around here is, is, is wild, actually, because like you say, you go from one valley to the other valley, and you're going to see a completely different climate even, um, whether it goes from 100 degrees to 70 degrees just in 30 miles or whatever. So um, that there provides completely different growing conditions for the growers in those areas. So, yeah, we, we have, have right now, though, and, and what's crazy is, is how dry it is out here. So we have this major water constraints on the farmers, and they're seeing reduction in allocations of water. And that's not just in the Central Valley. That's right the way up to, let's say, Redding, the north of the, north of the Central Valley, and then even out into some of those um, counties out close to the Oregon border that when there's literally towns with zero water allocation now. So there has been some big constraints been thrown out there by the state. And then as we go up into Oregon, you've mentioned that state, um, we're seeing a lot of different people with uh, commenting extensively on the lack of water. So, and even Washington, Eastern Washington, it's dry out there. Yeah. Um, Idaho, well, I think they got plenty of water, but um, again, much less diversity of crops out there with your potatoes and sugar beets. Um, but they still grow a lot of wheat and a lot of um, different stuff up there. But where we come from, the South Valley, um, if we, we call it that, um, the Imperial Valley, and then the Salinas Valley, and then the Yuma area where um, I visit a lot of it. Uh, we do a lot of business there with the row crop and the lettuce and the vegetables there. Um, yeah, very dry. And the produce pricing as well has gone down considerably. Yeah. So they're seeing reduction in in their in their in their sales because of the price of the produce so yeah, yeah but we as we travel from valley to valley we we have to try and keep a grasp on what's grown there and how the farmers like to and you get guys that have always run a certain tire because that's what their grandfather's done so just bringing the training in and constantly working with our customers yeah especially in an area like that where you know, you can go in and you can plant and the way they plant, you know, they could even be doing a transplant scenario. They could be going in and planting seeds. They could do all these things. But the majority of those 400 plus crops that get harvested in, in California and in Oregon to that, to that point, probably 75% of those are still done with some level of manual labor involved in it, whether it's the planting mm -hmm. process or the, or the, the actual harvest process. I watched a deal on Twitter the other night and it was, it was in Southern California and they were, they were harvesting watermelons <clears throat> and, you know, they pick all the watermelons, they throw them at the edge of the field. And then a guy comes by with the truck and there's like four or five guys just throwing watermelons up to three or four guys up in the truck and they're just stacking them in there. I mean, those are all things that you have to take into consideration when you start looking at efficiencies and labor and those kind of things. And I guess, how is all of that playing into what, like what we see right now with going off labor shortages and COVID-19 and so on and so forth. 
how how has that been in California with as far as that that labor goes and, and finding people to come and and work the fields? Especially in this southern area of the state, I'm talking the Imperial Valley and Yuma area. They've had programs which have run for years and years and years and years, um, where they're, um, where persons from the southern border, uh, from the southern side of the border, as in Mexico, are able to apply for a work permit and come over and then go back the same day. Um, those permits have not really been issued this year, um, and last year due to COVID-19. So, um, that's put a huge pressure and we're talking five to 6,000 persons daily crossing the border just to come and work in our fields. And that's been a really great program. It's helped us, um, with our labor shortages and it's obviously helped Mexico bring money in. So it's been great for that. But yeah, a lot of these, these growers down there are really struggling to get labor this year. And as a result of that, it's really affecting their production. So, um, yeah, that's that's a considerable one to think about. And, and you talking about the melons there, that really reminded me of a, something I saw I, maybe five or six years out when I was driving out in the valley. Um, I was driving along in, um, near Fresno area, and you may know the town. It's a little town called Mendota, and it's actually called the, uh, I think it's the cantaloupe capital of the world. Um, it's like their little slogan. And a lot of cantaloupes grown there and I'm driving along and they get every guy and his pickup truck to haul these melons in. And just like you say, they have these little four wheel trailers that haul along and they throw the melons in there. And I'm seeing a Toyota Tacoma coming down the road with two of these four wheel trailers hooked on the back of it. And I have no idea how he managed to keep that truck on the road, but <laughs> there's some crazy stuff happens out there. <laughs> That's a practice. That's how. That's how he did it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's a. It's a very unique area, and you start to look at, you know, if you go to the very northern part of California, you, there are some what we consider to be tr- traditional row crops. You start seeing some some wheat and those kind of things. Um, but at the same time, it's a different kind of production up there too, because of the hilly nature of of the area that they farm. You start right. looking at you know side hill combines and. A completely different setup than any Midwestern farmer is ever going to ever look right. at and understand. Yeah, we'll talk about I mean, that a little bit. So, Northern California has been very well re- renowned for its rice. They typically uh-huh. have grown five hundred and twenty-five thousand acres of rice, but there's been serious reduction on that because the city of LA has pretty much bought a lot of their water allocation, uh-huh. and. So there's, I think I did hear a rough number that uh, about 30 to 40% of the growers are not actually going to grow rice this, this year because of the water allocation problem. Um, and obviously that has to be extremely flat there. That's pretty much from, let's say, Yuba City south down to Woodland area. Um, north of that, there's a little bit of wild rice. Um, where we see the the wheat and the uh, the wild um, the um, in the Palouse area up in eastern Washington and the hillside combines. So yeah, that's that's yeah. where they grow a lot of the red wheat, white wheat, and um, that's grown up there on the uh, eastern side there in the Palouse and and through to the, you know some of the Pasco area where they do potatoes as well. Yeah, yeah, in that think- area too. Like, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, you know, having a chance to travel around with Mike, I think one of the things I, I found most interesting, Casey, is I don't envy the equipment sales guys in this part of the country because, you know, to everyone's point, they have to keep so much in yeah. their minds about their their growers. We talked to one uh, landowner down there who had uh, vines, he had pistachios, he had almonds. Um, and he had just after studying for five years and putting it all on a spreadsheet, evaluating how much labor I'm going to need versus my equipment investment and the trade-offs, everything. He said, I'm going to take a portion of my land and I'm going to try my hand at blueberries. And that is very unlike the heartland of, of the United States for my, you know, So to keep all of that in your mind and then lump on the things you can't control, like COVID-19, lack of water and all this other stuff. I mean, it's, it's insane. So um, it's just really interesting to hear from the grower's perspective though. Here's a guy who is trying to evaluate those trade-offs you guys have been talking about and 
it took him five years to run the numbers and evaluate and finally take a chance to even further diversify his crop in an attempt to protect himself from some of those things that we've been talking about that you can't control. So it was interesting to see firsthand for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's just a unique place. You know, you start looking at things like pistachios, which I was going to go to next, but, and, and just the whole, the nut side of the, of, of agriculture, whether it's pistachios, hazelnuts, almonds, all those kind of things. I want to say like, isn't it something like 60% of the world's hazelnuts are grown in Oregon? Does that sound right? That sounds about right. Plants. Yeah. And about <clears throat> 90% yeah. of the world's almonds are grown in California. Um, yeah. And pistachios are getting up there too. I mean, historically about a hundred, about a hundred thousand acres of almonds have been planted every year for about the last 25 years. So, mm -hmm. um, and obviously some of that is rotating crop now. Um, constantly they're pulling trees out and putting new in because on the almond side, you get your first yield at about three years, usually a pretty small yield. And then it's getting full growth at about five to six years. And then, and then they're pulling them out. Some of the big corporate farms will pull them out at 20. Some of them will leave them into 20, 25, 30, um, depending how production goes. But um, that was an interesting point you just made there, Jesse. Uh, if you remember meeting Jordan with the uh, blueberry farm, and he only planted mm -hmm. 200 acres as a trial, which was really interesting. And he'd actually had to get a variety of blueberry that would actually sustain and live in the California environment because typically blueberries, as you would know, Casey, are grown up on the, the north side of Washington and up into Canada yeah. where they can sustain wetter and colder environments. So that has been a really interesting thing for me to even notice that um and and one thing that was really interesting with his point um on that ranch if you noticed jesse was he had uh, uh, a fresh um planting of almond trees there one to two years old and right down the middle of the rows because they're 22 foot spacing on those trees he, right down the middle of the row he was growing alfalfa uh, and and going to be ready to harvest that. So just utilizing that area in the middle, Casey, I yeah. thought that was really, e um, really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that is, that that taking advantage of that stuff. You even see some guys down in some real crop country where they'll be growing, they plant soybeans into their wheat. And as the wheat grows up first, you know, they can go cut the wheat. And then when the wheat's cut, the, it gives a chance for the, the soybeans to rise up out of that. And, and you know, kind of add it, take away some of that wheat pressure and stuff like that you're seeing. But, but yeah, like you said, you know, utilizing every ounce of the ground out there mm -hmm. to farm because of the diversification. And I mean, diversification is great because if something's going going that going sour, usually there's something else that's gaining. But this has been a very unique year where with COVID shutdowns and you start looking at you know not as much demand for the for the restaurant business for the fresh produce and and even in the grocery stores for that matter. I mean, just there was just this demand of uh, you said plenty of articles where they're you know thrown away rotted you know produce that that never even made it to the market because they had no buyers for it so i mean a lot of those impacts you see happening out there so you kind of you kind of talked about it a little bit to start with mike but as you see now are you starting to see more of that produce kind of starting to pick back up the, as far as pricing goes are you seeing more of a gradual increase but or or is there still a little lull there that they're trying to work their way through yeah, I, I can't really speak to the market price, but I mean, that's what I hear from my, my customers and my customers are the deer dealers, the case dealers, uh -huh. yeah. um, the New Holland dealers, Kubota dealers, et cetera. And what they're saying is their growers are still not seeing it. So I'm getting it kind of third hand. There is a possibility that it has increased, but due to COVID-19, um, hate to use the word because I think we're all bored of it, but I mean, people like McDonald's huge chain of restaurants there um, have stopped serving salads. So yeah. that would have a huge impact in the marketplace. And I think Taco Bell the same. Um, not that we go there all the time, but you can imagine right. with these salads, there's just, there's, it, it makes a big difference to the, these growers like, um, like, um, like these people down in, in Yuma and, and Imperial and Salinas area, they just don't have the, the, the money coming back. So mm -hmm. it's been a big thing for them. Yeah. All right. So we got all this, all this diversification going on and <clears throat> you got row spacing all over the place and you've got just different needs by different people for different things. I've watched 
so many, especially in the, in the produce side of agriculture, so many autonomous vehicles that have come to the marketplace that are doing a mm-hmm. bunch of different stuff that are actually out there going that now. But holy crap, as you, you know, you talk about the dealer side of the business and, and keeping everything straight. H- how do you possibly keep tire <laughs> spacing, wheel width, rims? I mean, I mean, I can't imagine what your warehouse out there looks like. There's probably like two of everything. So <laughs> talk about you're not that far wrong there. You're not far wrong there. And it's a bit crazy. And, and, yeah. and, uh, yeah, you get one guy in one town who wants to do 72 inch row spacing. And just because he's doing 72, the guy down the road decides he's going to do 74 just to be one better. So that's just another dimension to throw in there. But typically, yeah, we see a lot of 80 inch out here, um, uh-huh. which would be a 40 inch bed. Uh, and then there's some people that would just do a 20 inch bed. So that all pertains to the 80 inch tractor. Um, but then you get a lot of strawberries that are run on like 48s and 52s, which ends up being, you know, one Oh, whatever that's one Oh four or, um, 96 is. And so it just ends up with complications there. Tomatoes are typically run on 80 inch, um, or a lot of sixties as well. Um, yeah. and, but, yeah, it's something that you just have to constantly keep in front of. And it's all about questioning as uh, our, our customers, what are you doing with the tractor? What's your customer trying to achieve? Um, what's the, the, the row spacing they want? What is the clearance you need under the axles? Um, and then we get people calling us and saying, you know, it, this, this tire is just, you know, it's an inch or two wide, you know, because we're just touching the leaves on the lettuce or whatever. So we're constantly having to go with narrower, skinnier tires in those, those vegetable rows. And that's, that's a big problem you can't have damaged lettuce. Yeah. And I think, I think one of the differences we see is that tolerance, especially on the West coast is so much tighter Casey than it is mm-hmm. oh, even yeah. in the Midwest. I mean, these guys are talking sometimes a quarter of an inch just because of how unique and delicate some of the crops are. So Yep. We got our work yep. cut out for us, but you know, job security, I guess. Exactly. <laughs> well, that kind of gave away all the next, secrets. <laughs> it kind of comes back to my next question. So, I've been around a, a little bit of specialty equipment, not not a big, nothing like blueberry harvesters or hazelnut harvesters, anything like that. But but typically, when you have a specialty piece of equipment, it usually has some kind of odd tire size of sorts that come along with that. Mm-hmm. So when you guys are looking at that kind of stuff, how does that, how does that work in there? And then when you're looking at doing those kind of things, like how do you decide what, what you're going to carry and how much of it you're going to carry and those kind of things for some of those really kind of really off the wall tire sizes that you kind of see out there sometimes. A lot of this equipment, we, we have to go by what the manufacturers provide. So for example, you're using um, some of these, not harvesting equipment or something like that, or uh, and the manufacturers build a machine around a tire and wheel sometimes. Um, and some of these implements, it's the same. They'll take a tire and wheel and build the machine around it. Um, where we've seen diversity in that is take the Salinas Valley and the Yuma Valley and the Imperial Valley again to talk about those. They'll take a tractor, take everything off of it, and to use a computer expression, cut and paste just move stuff around and just make sure that they've got steering on the tractors, uh, make sure that we're not hitting a def tank or a muffler or fuel tank of some sort or some weight package that's been put on the front to get extra weight there. And then the other thing that gets thrown in there is the weight capacity of the front tires often because they'll throw three, two, 300 gallon tanks on there, not even realizing that they've thrown 7,000 pounds on the front axle. Um, when, when yep. it's fertilizer. So these are things we're constantly thinking about and they call us up and say, oh, I broke my wheel. Well, for sure, you're going to break your wheel. Tractor weighs 8,000 pounds and you put 7,000 <laughs> extra on there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's the other side of it too is, you know, being, I've grown up in the Midwest my whole life, seen a 600 horsepower four wheel drive or a 400 horsepower row crop tractor, something like that going down the road. It's not a big deal. But seeing that, that hundred horsepower tractor that doesn't have a cab on it. You're like, why would you ever want one of those and go out to where you're, you're neck to woods. It's completely flipped around. Like you will see thousands of those hundred, 150 horsepower, even all the way down to like 1560 horsepower tractors. 
up and then you see the occasional combine and the occasional big four wheel drive and those kind of things. But it's a whole different animal out there because just like what you said, you never know what you're going to get into. And they're, it's a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a custom shop of, of kind of getting everything to work the way it needs to. Exactly. And, and one of the common ones out here is pipe tractors. You just mentioned 50, 60 horsepower pipe tractors, typically, you know, 45, you know, your, your, your 45 horsepower through to 90 horsepower tractors. And that's for hauling the aluminum pipe around for irrigation. So we see a lot of those. And then, and those would typically all be a ROPS tractor um, for the very reason, you know, keep the price down. Can we, can we put a $20,000 tractor in that field with a, you know, six to ten thousand dollars set of wheels and tires on it, <laughs> just exactly. so we get the clearance under the axles and the row spacing correct, because they definitely don't want to be running over that spinach or whatever it is. Yeah. You know, celery, broccoli. Um, they got to get the irrigation in there, and there is certainly none coming from the sky, so they have to draw it out of some river or well from somewhere. Yep. Yeah, there's a a lot of a lot of just it's just such a unique area, all that area up there. Whether you're going from like you said, California, just it's 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 a really unique state. I I looked at a at a, a job out there like ten or fifteen years ago, and it was up in I think it was the Modesto area, up in that area. But I was looking at that and I was thinking, oh, this is cool. You know, you could you could seriously go snow skiing on one weekend and the next weekend go to the beach in San Diego and have two completely diverse activities and enjoy them all in the same month. You know what I mean? It's just, yeah. it's a, it's just a, it's a very unique area that it's unlike any other place in the United States for sure. And, and to be quite honest with you on the planet for that matter, I mean, it's just a very unique area. And, and yeah. you can, you can hear about that. And I did for the first year I was here, but man, I, I would highly encourage, especially your, your listeners who are connected with, you know, multi-location dealerships Man, go out and see it, go out and touch the yeah. produce. I mean, we often found ourselves literally stopping the car, getting out and going into the fields and actually seeing how they do it. It is phenomenally interesting. So yeah, you, you got to see it. Well, I hope to sometime, hopefully maybe this year, depending on what's going on with, with COVID and get everything open. I like that, but I've always wanted to go to the, the, the to Larry farm show and, and go to that and just see it's a, it's at the biggest outdoor farm show in the, on earth isn't that their kind of claim to fame i like believe that. that's correct yep it is and, huge and man but it's uh it's unlike anything else you ever see though because there's hardly any real like traditional row crop stuff represented there mm -hmm. it's just it's nut harvesters it's blueberry stuff it's strawberry stuff it's produce stuff it's so it's a it'd be a very unique show to go to and and uh and just to meet these people and the amount of traffic that comes in internationally to that show is even another big thing. And just there's the number of people that come to California to see how ag works. It's very unique. No, that's a, that is a definitely a must for you. Absolutely. I'd say because the diversity of what you see there from mm -hmm. your regular row crop tract of like you see in the Midwest from deep tillage tree and harvesting equipment for all the, uh, the orchards and, and, even they have some crazy equipment for pruning these trees, you know, major, yeah. major equipment. Some of it's quite large. And then um, your shakers for the, uh, the, uh, the nuts and the pickup equipment, bank out wagons, all that crazy stuff. There's so much of it. And uh, it's not something you're going to walk around in one day either, Casey. It's, it's something that yeah. you, you would want. I typically would go once a year. Um, well, sorry, not once a year, obviously, because only once a year, but I would go one day every year just to go and just to get, get fresh grasp on everything. That's what I've done in the last 10 years. Obviously, 2020, that didn't happen. Um, and sorry, 21, I should say, didn't happen. And then, um, yeah, it's going to be, that was the first time in a long time um that i haven't been to a tillery farm show and and, yeah. and you're lining up at, at, at walking in and somebody's pulling in with montana plates or you know uh kentucky plates and you talk to them and you know they've just driven the whole way you know they just there's some growers just uprooted taking a week's vacation go to the tillery farm show um, very unique very unique area so well my uh Jesse, you have anything else you want to throw in there before we, before we shut down the podcast? Well, you know, I would just throw out for your listeners, um, 
just again, a little plug for how we fit into the ecosystem, we being Axon. Um, we really don't consider ourselves a, a tire and wheel company, although we do a lot of that. Um, our mission, we wake up every day passionate about helping dealers move more equipment. And we believe if we can do that well, show up as a partner, give you guys the resources, we're going to sell plenty of tires and wheels along the way. That just happens to be what we know a lot about, right? So um, again, to that end, if if your dealers or even growers are trying to do something unique, and certainly in Mike's part of the country, there's a lot of that, um, ask your dealer um, or call us directly, call Mike. Um, we could sit around and talk about these type of things all day. And we've got almost a hundred years of experience from which to draw to solve some of these problems. And we know a lot of your dealers or you guys are looking for that competitive advantage. So what I'd like to say is imagine if you had a hundred years of tire and wheel knowledge in your back pocket, next time you go sell a piece of equipment, that's how, that's how we fit in. We're that partner. We're really a solution provider that happens to know a lot about tires and wheels and, um, we like to be passionate about showing up and supporting the dealer. So anybody listening to this podcast, we'd like to give a free gift. Um, we've got these really cool um, tread depth gauges that, again, if we're a tool and resource, that's really sort of the picture here, right? It's a really cool tool and resource that whether you're a grower or a dealer, it helps you kind of monitor and evaluate the tread depth on these these large tires. So free gift to all your listeners. All you guys have to do is head to our website or call us um, and just literally use the word tread depth. And we'll uh, make sure you get a free, um, really, it's like an OTR tire tread depth gauge that'll help you measure and evaluate the health and and, uh, tread depth of, of your tire. So free gift for your listeners this month. Give us a call, shoot us an email, use the word tread depth, and we'll make sure to get that free gift out to all of the Moving Iron podcast listeners. Just as, again, a picture to show you that we're a resource here for the agriculture industry specific to, you know, the dealers. So free gift for you guys this month. There's anything that that farmers like, it's free gifts. So I'm sure you're going to give out a lot of, (laughs) you're going to give out a lot of tread tread depth gauges. But that's that's the very important part of that too, because, you know, and not everyone's finger is the same length and not every pin is the, is the same length either. So <laughs> when you right. take a picture of that, you know, it's pretty, pretty, pretty important to understand what you got there. So uh, that, that'll be, that'll come in handy. And that way everybody's 50%. It's what 50% is supposed to be and not, not, Amen. Just, not just a guess <laughs> based on someone's finger. So, hey, Mike, Mike, so how, how can people get a hold of you, Mike? What's a good way for them to contact you directly? Um, usually either email or you could text me or uh, I'll answer to anything pretty much. All right. So throw out your email address and phone number for uh, all the Moving Iron listeners. Okay. Today, so my email is mike.lewis at axontire.com. That's M-I-K-E dot L-E-W-I-S at A-X-O-N-T-I-R-E dot com. And then my um, best number to catch us on here actually is our toll-free number because I'm often backed up, which is 877-536-3276. All right. Hit us up at either one of those avenues, and we'll make sure to get your uh, free gift out to you guys this month. And I'm excited to continue to participate and support um, this podcast because, again, I think it's a great resource, Casey, for growers and dealers. And that's what we're all about. So we are, we are again, continuing to uh, position ourselves with people like you, that that's what you wake up every day and are passionate about too. So thank you again for the opportunity. We love it. No, it's my pleasure guys. And I I do, I do appreciate the uh, support that you've given me and, and uh, I look forward to uh, next month. We do this again. There we go. Mike, you have any last words you want to throw out there before we close it down? Oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> like Jesse says, we could talk on this all day long because pretty passionate <laughs> about what we do every day. Um, one thing, the only point I wanted to throw out there really, I um, mean, we do get it. The marketplace is different than what it was, you know, a year ago. You got logistics with challenges, you know, freight and difficult um, situations there with truck drivers and boats backing up in the, uh, 
in the port here, right here, half an hour from me, or actually more like 20 minutes from me, we can go out there and see the boats all parked, waiting to get into the port, you know, 16 or 20 of them at a time. Go down to Long Beach, it's the same. Tacoma, it's the same. Over on the East Coast, I know there's a lot of ports there. They're all backed up. And, uh, and the weather constraints, you know, all these different, there's so much difference than what it was a year ago. So we got to roll with the punches and we're ready to listen to our customers and see what they've got to say. Lack of equipment, another one. So let's, uh, let's constantly fight the battle. And the only other point I wanted to make was when we're seeing Euro tractors coming in, there's a lot of tractors coming in from Europe, you know, your Fence, your McCormick's, your Deutz Fars, your Klaus tractors, they're coming in with Euro tires. And we're we're doing everything we can to get these tires, um, the right tires on these these Euro tractors, so they can get them in the fields. Right on. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great point. The <clears throat> European tractor specs are incredibly more different than than what you think they would be from what's going on in the U.S. But mm-hmm. that's a great point to to put in there as well. So, well, guys, I appreciate you guys being on the podcast. Thanks awesome. again, Casey. Look forward to it next yeah. month. Well, I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Make sure you check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. That's where you're going to find the latest editions of the Moving Iron Podcast. Also go to movingironllc.com. You can find the entire library of the Moving Iron Podcast as well as all the blogs I have posted there. Don't forget about the Moving Iron Summit coming up here in Nashville, Tennessee, September 15th to the 17th. Uh, That'll be in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, All the information you need is on the website. Go to the navigation bar, click on Moving Iron Summit, and you'll get all the information you need there. Jesse and his crew will be there, and they're going to have uh, have a booth there. So if you have any tire questions you might have, they'll be there to, to answer those for you. So with that, I am Casey Seymour with Mike and Jesse. Let's go move some iron, folks. Out. You want to have a meaningful competitive advantage to help sell more equipment. Whether you represent the sales, parts, or management department of an implement dealership, there's a surprising amount of complexity when it comes to tire, wheel, and track technology. Let Axon worry about that so you can get back to supporting your customers. Axon has leveraged years of experience to create a streamlined process that gives you a proven path to help today's grower and sell more equipment. The roots of their organization go back almost 100 years to the invention of the rubber tractor tire. Supporting agriculture is the number one driver of Axon from product development through sales and service. To find more or become an Axon dealer, head over to axontire.com. Moving higher in the 21st century Hard-working people working hard for you and me Moving higher time and time again Through the years you'll find us here Moving higher